very much for a warm welcome. It's nice to be back at CSRM. Uh, certainly in Anglo-American, we've done a lot of work with SMI in general, uh, particularly with uh, CSRM, so it's always nice to, to visit and meet some of you. Um, this is a huge topic, so I've been given about 30 minutes, so I'm really going to try and focus on it from our perspective as a mining company. There's a huge literature out there, uh, the economics, the politics, the governance of the mining sector. I'm not going to try and recap on that, but just trying to think about how we as a business respond to these issues. And firstly, just to sort of explain a little bit as to why it's relevant, um, Anglo American, is, as Salim says, we're one of the world's five largest mining companies by, by market cap. We're probably the biggest by, in terms of the number of people we employ. And, and that's our footprint. So we're producing a range of commodities. Most of them are industrial. Uh, the exception is, is diamonds. We own 85% of De Beers. Um, so that's the sort of consumer facing brand. It's probably, it's probably the most famous mining company in the world in some ways, but actually quite a small part of our business, relatively speaking. And the diamond industry is overall, it's actually a very small part of the global mining industry. But predominantly producing industrial commodities and predominantly in emerging markets, although Canada and Australia being sort of notable exceptions. We have growing interests here and growing interests in Canada as well. But our roots are in South Africa, uh, and as you can see, the majority of our operations are very much in an emerging market context, um, which is relevant to um, the resource nationalism debate, but it's not just a, an issue in emerging markets. Uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the experience we've had around the world, but the UK, for example, its oil and gas regime is notorious for changing the price, changes in the oil price. Uh, so resource nationalism is something we see uh, occurring pretty much everywhere where we're operating. And just in terms of some definitions, there's no formal definition, and I won't read all of these out, but I think the first one, in a sense, sums up um, sort of the broad, the broad topic area. So it encompasses efforts by resource-rich nations to shift political and economic control of their energy and mining sectors from foreign and private interests to domestic and state controls, and sorry, state control companies. And the control doesn't necessarily mean ownership, and I'll talk about that in a, uh, a little bit later. And it's probably also worth saying, as well as resource nationalism, one of the things we're having to address as, as a mining company is also, in a sense, resource localism as well. So not only do countries feel that those mineral rights, the subsurface minerals, are very much vested in the state, and in all the countries where we are, they are vested in the state, uh, and therefore our national property. There's a very strong and growing sense from community groups that actually they're not really the states, they're theirs. And so that creates an additional... Uh, dynamic and in, in some senses an additional tension between local communities and their governments as to who has ownership and who should get the benefits of developing those resources. Now in terms of drivers, I mean the, there are many, uh, and again there's been lots of work on this, but from our point of view there seem to be uh, some critical ones that, that we're aware of. So firstly, um, the profits in the mining industry are perceived to be high. Um, I say perceived, because actually if you look at the long run return on capital in the mining sector, it's actually not particularly impressive compared to some other sectors. But the, the sector is dominated by very large companies, and very large companies, even if they're making reasonably modest returns, end up making billions of dollars profit. So we're perceived to be extremely profitable, and at times, you know, in the recent past, we have been very profitable. So Anglo-Americans' two record years for profits were within the last four years, for example. So you know, we are profitable, and that, that creates a target particularly at times when governments around the world are struggling for revenues um, for, for all sorts of reasons, including sort of the economic downturn in, in Europe and North America, for example. There's a lack of perceived benefits to host communities and to countries, and that's a pretty common, uh, common uh, view in many places where we operate. Uh, and this concept of a fair share, now nobody's ever really defined what a fair share is, um, but, and, and that's probably impossible to define to a certain extent, but you know, that, that sense that maybe people aren't getting all the benefits that they think they should be getting. And then also just the rebalancing of the world economy away from sort of the traditional OECD economies into emerging markets, so Brazil, China, India, etc., so Sub-Saharan Africa. So, and again, a sense that perhaps some of those producing countries don't necessarily just need to be passive takers of investment from from, from Western countries and actually perhaps should have some more control themselves. Sort of more sort of cultural and technological factors, so obviously the communications revolution, much easier for people to compare benefits, to talk about uh, what they're getting from their mining sectors. Um, 
a growing intolerance of poverty, uh, which itself is obviously a good thing, and, and growing and changing expectations on the role of business in society in general, and the, and the mining sector certainly is not immune to those changing expectations. Um, it's probably fair to say that mining is generally seen to be a part of the problem by many commentators on many of the global issues of the day, whether it's water or biodiversity or corruption, for example. Uh, most people's perception of mining is a negative one. And I, what I often do when I'm dealing with audiences that aren't particularly familiar with mining issues is to do a quick straw poll to ask who has a positive impression of the mining sector and who has a negative impression. And on gen generally speaking, you get a one or two percent um, group who are positive and the rest are negative and then you find out that one or two percent of people work in the industry and actually know a bit more about it. Now that's not to say that everybody should be 100% positive, there are many issues that the industry needs to address, but the perception out there at large is actually a very negative one and I'll show you a little bit of information later on that. Uh, and, and part of that actually is because of some of the legacies. Now, in terms of water use, for example, mining uses about 1% of fresh water resources on average, you know, agriculture uses 70%. In terms of land use, the, the percentages are similar, actually. So we know the facts of the matter is that many of these global issues, although mining may be a big player at a local level, at the global level, it may not be material, but that's not the perception out there. And that is often because of the legacies. And we sometimes forget how big those legacies are. So I think in the state of Nevada alone, there are about a quarter of a million abandoned metals mines that are causing sort of local environmental pollution. So those legacies are very real, and, and some of us who in the industry are very forward-looking and are trying to run sites that meet all the modern standards forget about some of the past and some of the history, which for us is history, but for some of those communities remains very much the present day. Um, and then there are political drivers. So again, the, the emergence of some of the um, sort of emerging market economies, uh, and also the rise of democracy and local empowerment. When I look at the countries that we operate in, you know, most of our operations are in uh, South Africa, Brazil and Chile, for example. 20, 30 years ago, none of those were democratic states. 30 years ago, none of those were democracies. And obviously, as, as you have a more open democratic culture, then there's greater accountability. There's people, people feel empowered, as they should, to, to raise issues that they're concerned about. There's probably more debate and, and more genuine interaction with society of some of those changes. And then I think finally, to compound all of those problems, which are real problems, um, as in industry, we're not very good at communicating. And actually, Anglo-American has recently become the managing sort of shareholder in De Beers before then we were a minority shareholder before last year. And their approach to communication, because they're a consumer-facing brand, is so much more sophisticated than the rest of our group. Um, you know, we don't, in a sense, diamonds talk to consumers and they need to create a particular impression for consumers to want them. Copper, iron ore, you don't have to do that. You just, you know, and there are things you can do to get a, a marginally better price, but on the whole, it's the quality of your product which, which sells. Um, so we're not sophisticated communicators. If you compare us against fast moving consumer goods or banks and so on and so forth, we, we really don't articulate the benefits we bring or really understand some of the criticism we get or how we should manage that. And then finally, um, the risks of being in the mining industry are often not well understood by um, outside stakeholders. So they will very often therefore think that the returns we get are, are excessive. And, and actually, if you look at you know, those of you that follow the mining industry closely, I think it's now up to 30, was it 50 billion dollars in write downs in the last three or four years, which illustrates just how high risk mining projects are. But what a local stakeholder might see is those success stories. So once the mine's up and running, you know, it might be very profitable, but the chances of getting a mine up and running on budget, on time, have actually been quite low in recent years. And so people see the profits being made. They don't see all the failures in the exploration phase. They don't see the projects that didn't make the hurdle rate to get invested in. They don't see the difficulties that the industry's had delivering some of these projects in recent years. So in a sense, we talk about our successes and people focus on that. And they just see a very profitable mine and don't realize that actually that was a survivor out of a, possibly a thousand exploration projects at early stage, a hundred detailed drilling campaigns. 10 projects looked at uh, due to say, uh, feasibility phase, maybe only two or three of those got built, and, and mm -hmm. maybe some of those got built with problems. So we, the, there's a limited understanding of the risks we face as a business. People think anybody can make money in mining, and of course we're seeing at the moment that actually making money in mining, as in most businesses, is actually generally quite difficult, and you need to be quite good at what you do. Just in terms of how the industry is perceived, um, I quite like this cartoon, probably dig out South America as well. <laughs> that's, that's often a, um, 
that's often a common perception, you know. Even people who frankly ought to know a little bit better um, say that. So Bill Gates said something last year or the year before, he said $250 billion worth of commodities have been exported from Africa in the last decade, and Africa's got no benefit from that. So you think, well, hang on a minute. But, you know, somebody who's very involved in development issues and sort of a huge proportion of his personal wealth is resolving some of these developmental issues can say a comment like that. Uh, it shows we've got some way to go. And this is the one that really rankles. Um, mining sector, in terms of how we're perceived, um, we're actually slightly worse than banking, which is someone who lives in London who, who uh, deals with people you know, who work in the banking sector and people friends who work in the banking sector. You know, just to mess with their heads sometimes, we talk about why you did something, and you say, well, it's because our value said we wanted to do it that way. And that's quite a common thing in the industry, actually. I think most people in the mining sector do have quite strong values, whereas in the banking sector, value is something that has a dollar sign in front of it. And not much else. So to, we're actually ranked below banking, even after sort of several years of financially related crisis. The, the one bit of good news is actually banking is going backwards and we're going forwards, but that does again beg the question of where we started. So, so in terms of resource nationalism, these are all sort of conditioning factors which create what is frankly a pretty hostile environment for us in the sector. You know, we're not well thought of, we're not well understood, um, and we need to do a much better job of that. And sort of resales nationalism in practice, people often assume it's actually expropriation and nationalisation. I mean, that tends to be quite rare. And it normally starts off with taxes and royalties. And just about everywhere where we've operated, we've seen the tax and royalty regime change uh, in the last three or four years. And, and typically those changes are not in favour of us or our shareholders. Um, sometimes there have been some positive changes, but on the whole, it, the, the agenda is to extract uh, greater revenues from, from mining. Beyond that, you get things like local content and value-add requirements. That might be local procurement requirements. It might be requirements to do beneficiation of your product, to add value before you export. So, you know, if you've got iron ore, then make steel before you export. It doesn't always work, so with coal, clearly coal, turn it into electricity, and you only need to do that where, where the electricity is required. But in a lot of our product streams now, we're getting pressure from host governments to try and add more value locally, um, even though people like Paul Collier will tell you that's probably the last thing they should be doing. They should be taking those revenues, and rather than sort of cross-subsidizing downstream production, they should be trying to diversify the economy. But it's a very strong political pressure, you can understand why governments feel the need to do that. We're also seeing uh, indigenization, so that's a requirement for local ownership requirements. Uh, and sometimes that ownership requirement is with a state company, sometimes it's with a private company. So in South Africa, for example, it's not state, it's actually private investors. Uh, black South African private investors is the requirement. In other countries, there is a more of a requirement for, for the government to participate. And then finally, expropriation, which is that it tends to be relatively rare uh, these days. So uh, selected countries, these are countries that we have interest in or, or are interested in more generally. So just taking some of the changes we've seen over the last few years. So Australia obviously had the mineral resource rent tax, very uh, closely watched internationally, huge controversy here in Australia, of course. In Botswana, the government there is very keen to turn its diamond uh, endowment into uh, a downstream processing industry, so the developed the cutting and polishing industry. The De Beers is now currently moving its diamond trading activities from London, where they've always historically been held down to Cabarone, uh, to try and develop um, some of the local service sectors. It's about $6 billion worth of diamonds will be traded each year, so and people coming in will be spending money to, to boost the banking system, to boost to sort of business tourism and so on. Uh, Brazil taxes, um, the oil and gas sector in particular, Brazil, has some very strong local content requirements, and we will see more of that in the mining sector, I'm sure. And then state participation. Vale used to be state-owned and was largely privatised, but the government has retained quite a significant stake and clearly owns Petrobras as well, which is a leading emerging oil producer. Chile, there was a voluntary oil in increase in 2010 in the aftermath of the earthquake. Um, Quite how voluntary it would have been had the companies not agreed to it is, is moot. And then Fidelco remains a very important um, sort of copper producer. It's the world's largest copper producer. 
and actually a source of very significant pride for, for Chileans as well. So if you're going up against Hidalgo in any dispute, as we did last year before we came to a, a resolution, uh, you'll seem to be going against Chile. It's not, uh, it's not you versus a company, it's you versus Chile. And uh, some of our Chilean employees felt that very strongly. Colombia, again, tax royalty concessions under review. Mozambique, um, probably a 10 years ago, was very eager to attract any sort of investment. It has now demonstrated that it's a good place to invest, though it's changing the terms slightly. Um, and increasing, increasingly interested in things like free carry, so getting a share of a project without paying for it or without paying for the results in term capex. And then just a, a few others. Peru also had a voluntary windfall tax. Um, there are no sort of formal national concept requirements, but those of you that follow mining in Peru will understand that reaching agreements with the communities is a critical part of your formal and social license to operate. And local content requirements are often a part of that agreement. Um, South Africa, there was the state intervention in the mining sector report, which rejected nationalization, um, but did look to say that actually there should be another look at finding taxes. There are requirements for local procurement and also procurement from, from black South African owned businesses. Uh, and then um, the nationalization debate in a sense has been resolved and South Africa is not going to go down that route. I think partly because when they did some of the analysis, they worked out that about 90% of the value of mining in South Africa actually accrues to South Africans already. And most of the rest of it doesn't actually accrue to energy suppliers. Um, so I think there was a, a sort of a logical conclusion why pay 100% of the price of an industry to get the remaining small percentage benefit. And then uh, back economic value. Venezuela is probably been in some senses the one place that has done expropriation and nationalization, including of one of the like, small nickel mine we had. And then uh, Zimbabwe, again, local content requirements, and there's 51% local ownership from these days in Zimbabwe. So um, a range of tools governments are using to get increased benefits with nationalization or expropriation actually being quite rare. These and that's quite unlike the oil and gas sector. And people often talk about mining and oil and gas as extractives. And they often assume they're the same. And I think in many of the policy issues, actually mining has quite different characteristics to oil and gas. And ownership of reserves and of production is one of them. So this is a, a, a breakdown of who owns what in the um, in sort of the world, in terms of world oil reserves. And this is Saudi Aramco. This is a, the Iranian national oil company, Qatar, Iraq. Pedavetta in Venezuela, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, and so on. This bit here is the bit that's owned by private companies globally. So a very small proportion of oil and gas reserves are owned globally by um, oil and gas companies. And um, yeah, it's almost 90% of the reserves are owned by the state now. And in the 1970s and the 1960s, actually, the ownership of oil and gas looked very much like the ownership of the mining industry does today as well. Um, so there's a question that we're often asked is, did high prices in the oil and gas sector lead to uh, nationalizations? Um, and actually, we did some analysis, and it turned out that actually it was, it was actually the other way around, uh, that it was nationalizations that led to a small number of governments being able to operate a cartel, uh, which then led to the price rises. So OPEC, in effect, the OPEC governments um, nationalized, got control, created a cartel, and that led to the spike in oil prices. Um, and so you ended up with these changed ownership patterns. These, are, these relate to the size of um, uh, reserves. So actually, we've noticed that from 60 to 1980, the size of global oil reserves actually increased quite significantly. It has increased since. But over that time, it went from being two-thirds in OPEC, but also two-thirds privately controlled. By 1980, it was still two-thirds in OPEC, but it was two-thirds state controlled. And you saw um, a very significant shift from, pro from privately controlled to the state controlled. Now in the mining sector, as I say, could this happen? Well actually, like oil and gas, um, we did experience a whole wave of nationalizations in the post-colonial period, um, in particular in Africa, but also in South America. Uh, and so there were lots of nationalizations of mining assets in the 1960s and the 1970s, but that tended to peter out um, and you see it wasn't really associated with a similar sort of spike in prices. Uh, and the, the reasons have 
for that are many, but one of them is obviously that mining, you know, that there was a huge concentration of known oil and gas reserves in the Middle East, which are, and, and the OPEC countries, so Nigeria, Venezuela, and the Middle East, which did allow them to control prices. Mining commodities tend to be much more spread out around the world, so it's much harder for any one government to secure control over that resource. There are a couple of exceptions to that, so platinum, for example, is very heavily concentrated in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Um, diamonds are also quite heavily concentrated in Botswana uh, and South Africa, for example. But on the whole, most mining commodities are much more evenly spread out around the world. Um, so our view is that actually on the whole, um, large-scale nationalization of the mining sector, as we saw in the oil and gas sector, is pretty unlikely, actually. Um, as I mentioned, Price rises were not the trigger for nationalisation. It seems to be the other way around. There's plenty of circumstances, and also sort of more. If you look into the political history of those nationalisations, there's a lot of evidence to support that. Um, and we did see mining. Um, we did see a lot of nationalisations in the mining sector in the 60s and 70s. But then we saw a wave of privatisations, or sometimes more unfortunately, mine closures of state-owned mines in, in, in the late 80s and 90s. And we think that was probably for a few reasons. One is actually mining is inherently much less profitable than oil and gas. So the economic rents that you have from, from mining are, are much lower. So even a really choice, you know, really world-class copper or iron ore mine might have an operating margin of about 50%, which is pretty good, pretty good business if you can get it. Whereas an oil, you know, oil is about $120 per barrel at the moment. You know, Saudi Aramco pumps it out of the ground at something between $10 and $20 a barrel. So the profit margin there is absolutely enormous compared to mining oil really good mine, you might get a 50% margin. So, um, but most mines are actually, on the whole, quite marginal. And so you have to be quite good to be able to run them effectively. And they tend to have um, sort of quite significant technical challenges. So many of those are more unique, so you need a high degree of skill in managing some of them. And they also require very high ongoing capital expenditure to maintain them. So oil well, predominantly the capital investment in the oil sector, when you're thinking of well, your capex is mostly up front. In the mining industry, you've got a big upfront capital expenditure, but then you've got a big ongoing capital expenditure as well as you're developing new areas, new places, for example. And that makes it very hard for a government to sustain activity because you've always got a competition in a government budget between things like social services, education, and healthcare versus investing in new heavy mining equipment. And generally speaking, you know, things that touch voters will do much, you know, do much better in those budgeting processes. So it's very hard for state-owned mining companies to sustain the level of capital constrained public expenditure environment. As I mentioned before, very limited ability for governments to um, control commodity markets with a, a couple of exceptions. Um, and I suppose also these days, it, you know, it's, it's much harder for governments just to unilaterally nationalize things. If you've been following what happened with Argentina's debt, sovereign debt negotiations, they tried to default on things and actually are being sued all over the place by principally American hedge funds who are trying to get their money back because actually what Argentina did was breach bilateral treaties, which means that that's enforceable in international courts. So, and Venezuela has had similar issues. It has, you know, when it's nationalized some of its oil and gas assets, some of the companies affected have taken action against Venezuela outside the country and secured some quite good assets that people like Pedro Pesto have that have threatened to secure them. Perhaps more importantly, governments have realized they don't need to nationalize. They can raise taxes raise taxes, you don't need to compensate. That's seen as the legitimate thing for governments to do, and of course on the whole it is. Um, <laughs> and it seemed to be a significantly different approach to, to nationalisation, whereas expropriation, you know, if you're expropriated, you have a right to compensation. If the government puts up tax raising you well, that's, that's, that's part of the economic life of the country, and you can't get recourse for that. And I think probably lastly, and I want to talk about this a little bit more, um, as an industry, I think we have probably haven't learned as much as we should have done, but we do have a better understanding now of some of the drivers of resource nationalism. And I think particularly in the last 10 years, the mining sector has started to develop some much more effective responses to uh, some of those challenges than perhaps were available to us in the past. Um, so I mean, very broadly, how should we respond? I think firstly, being much clearer about some of the impacts we do have, positive and negative, and understanding those. Uh, there are lots of people out there communicating the negative impacts on our behalf. What we're not very good at is communicating some of the positive impacts that we have. So we need to engage in that debate much more effectively as an industry. We need to sort of try and 
address the negative perception of the industry as well. Um, and a lot of this is around uh, perceptions around business ethics, around sort of safety, health, environmental management standards on our minds. Um, you know, and again, the industry's made a lot of progress, but if you sort of, even, even if the very best in the industry, like Rio Tinto and BHP, or Strat to talk about their safety records, in company, companies like DuPont, the DuPonts of this world would be horrified at the, the injury rates that we have in the mining sector still. So there's still a long way to go on some of these issues. Uh, fair treatment of workers. Um, again, on the whole, mining is a highly unionized uh, industry. Mining wages generally are, are multiples of local blue collar wages in most of the countries where we operate. Certainly the case here in Australia, it's the case in South Africa, two to three times the more blue collar wages are what's paid by the mining sector. But even there, we have issues, so for example, housing. Um, mine workers in South Africa used to be housed in hostels, and they were given living out allowances so they could actually generate choose their own accommodation, but on the whole, uh, that hasn't led to satisfactory outcomes, so we as a business are going to have to get much more involved in providing housing for, for employees, for example. And then just more generally being good neighbours, and, and you know, that, the whole range of things that includes being very open to criticism, and going out and engaging, and taking an interest in the welfare of the communities around you. So we need to do all of that, and until we've got these sort of hygiene factors in place, it's probably going to be very hard for us as an industry to move, um, move those public perceptions of us. And then, um, I mean, fundamentally, a lot of the debate about resource nationalism is about communities and countries wanting to get in their share of the development benefits. And, and our contention is that actually, very often the focus is on tax. And the, the focus on tax is actually quite counterproductive because it's actually a very small proportion of the total benefit to be had. And I'll, I'll show you some figures from the margin to illustrate that. Now, in terms of engaging in some of the broader debate, I mean, there's there's the global debate around resource curse, there are national debates. And just quickly on resource curse, um, I mean, it is something that we as an industry need to in, engage more effectively with. The International Council on Mining and Records has been doing a lot of work on this in recent years to try and tease out some of the effects of mining. And they tend to, you know, people are talking about resource curse have tended to talk about sort of these four or five uh, key drivers. So one is around the terms of trade, and that's historically, commodity prices have tended to go down historically spikes, but so the long-term trend is down relative to other things one can purchase in the economy. And if you're relying on something whose value doesn't increase, then it's hard for you to increase your living standards. Uh, there's an issue around the volatility of markets, which makes it particularly difficult for resource-dependent countries um, to manage those, that volatility. But even, you know, even some quite big economies can struggle with the ups and downs of the commodity cycle. Dutch disease is um, Two related things. One is the appreciation of the currency. So Australia at the moment is very widely regarded to be undergoing Dutch disease. Seventy percent of your exports, I think, at the moment are natural resource exports, so which makes it particularly harder to attract tourism or export manufactured goods. And it's also about the allocation of factors of in, production into the resource sector, um, particularly skilled labour moving into the resource sector. Uh, negative impacts of mining, uh, and again, I think we have means of managing most of that these days. And then rent seeking, which is the world bank to a corruption potential. So people trying to control, uh, people trying to get wealthy by controlling wealth rather than creating wealth in a sense. Um, and you know, many of you will be familiar with some of the policy responses that have emerged over the last 10 to 15 years of some of these things. And also some of the counter arguments. So in terms of the terms of the trade, well, there are lots of things that have been falling in terms in relative terms, the price of air travel, the price of computers, the price of vehicles, for example has fallen very significantly, but if you can produce more productively, you can still make more money from a, a particular output, even if the price is not increasing as much as other outputs. There are ways of managing volatility, so lots of countries have offshore stabilization funds, for example, in the oil and gas sector and increasingly in the mining sector. Norway and Kuwait, for example, being good examples of that. Chile, the mining sector, has a copper fund where they park some of their revenues from the good times to, 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 to deal with lean years. Um, on Dutch disease, there are sort of, sort of uh, an, argue, an economic argument that says actually moving factors of production from a less productive sector to a more productive sector has another name. It's, that other name is economic growth, and that's fundamentally what all societies have done. They've moved from agriculture to manufacturing to the services, for example. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a bad thing, though, if you get to that point where all your factors of production are tied up in the resource industry, and then that stops because you've depleted the resource, and there's nothing people can migrate onto. So it's potentially a concern. As I say, we've got pretty good ideas of how we should manage many of these things, and there's a lot of progress being made now on um, 
anti-corruption initiatives. So EITI, for example, is getting some real uh, legs with some of the, the Western countries that back to signing up. So the UK and Australia being potential signatories. Uh, what well, signatories going forward? And then more broadly about the development impacts. Um, you know, how can we use the activity that we generate anyway to support development impacts? And these are. Um, this is actually a slide we put together for the course that Salim was referring to. Um, you know, where, what are the potential developmental benefits you can extract from a mining operation? Uh, and you'll see that taxation is there, and it should be there. You know, paying tax is the responsibility of the businesses, the world over, and um, it's, it's not something we should object to. But I think what's dangerous if the debate is only focused on these, partly because actually if you focus too much on taxes, inevitably you end up putting taxes up, and then most mining projects are actually quite marginal, so changes to the tax rates does affect investment decisions quite considerably, and probably much more than most people realise. But it's the, probably the bigger danger, actually, from a developmental point of view, is actually you're missing out on things which are much more important than the taxes. So the infrastructure we might put in, um, and uh, Mark Kutifani, who's the CEO of Anglo Gold Shanty, will be the Anglo American CEO from Port of April, gave a good speech at mining in Darbo in Cape Town about two weeks ago, where he talked about how when you look back at what mining companies used to do, they used to build towns, they used to build infrastructure, and then you know, in the 80s and 90s, of people, you know, the, the, the view that the business, business is, is business uh, became more prevalent. Um, mining companies pulled back from a lot of that sort of public service provision that we used to provide. Um, and he's saying, well, maybe we should think about that. You know, and perhaps actually what countries want from mining is, is they really want the developmental benefits, and very often that is an infrastructure benefit, particularly in some So infrastructure, jobs and wages, of course, and mining doesn't employ many people. Um, uh, again, that's a change from what it used to be. And, uh, and the, the, the trend actually is for increasing mechanization and increasing automation as well. So we can expect employment for any given particular unit of output in the sector to continue to decline, although the wages will go up um, commensurately as we employ higher and higher skilled people. Um, capacity building and training, so we, we invest a lot of money American, but also as an industry in training our own employees, in training people in schools and technical colleges and so on. Procurement's a huge lever for development. Small business development is uh, also very important. So uh, we run small business development programs which are currently supporting over 60,000 jobs. Uh, as a business, we employ about 150,000 people. So our, the jobs we're creating through small business development programs are you know, a very significant share of our, the employment we have as a total uh, business on our payroll. Uh, social investment is also important, and there's beneficiation. And I'll just talk about a few of those in a little more detail. Now, I mentioned before about it's important to th if you want to get the developmental benefits from mining, you know, from a country perspective as high as they should be. Really, what you want to start doing is looking at where the money flows. Because where the money flows is where you've got the ability to, to leverage that development. And for almost any mining company, this is the bit you should really focus on, actually, and that's procurement. So of our, this, we published our annual results last Friday, so this is the chart from 2011. But of about a $30 billion turnover, almost $14 billion uh, went in procurement. So our suppliers are by far the biggest beneficiaries of our business. After that, uh, I'm pleased to say it was our employees. Um, this is capital expenditure, and actually a lot of the capital expenditure is also procurement. Um, this is taxes, this is dividends to employees, and then uh, this was sort of interest on loans and so on. So you can see that taxes are quite significant. They're twice as big as um, dividends, for example, um, but they're nowhere near as big as, as these areas here. So if, if I was a government and I was wanting to leverage a mining sector, I would start with procurement. And what we're trying to do in Anglo American is, is work with our host governments to try and ensure that they understand that actually that's where they should be focusing. And that by you know you can expand this tax bit a bit, but if you go too far, in a sense, we'll stop investing because the returns won't be there. But there's actually lots of scope to enhance local participation in supply chains in various ways. So um, local training and procurement, trying to make sure that local people get those jobs. And certainly in our company, we have very few expatriates, but we do have a lot of internal migration for people coming to work in our mines. Um, building government capacity is something uh, we're doing more and more of. So we pay a lot of tax 
uh, both at the local level and at the national level, and one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that those taxes are well used. Because uh, often, where there is a failure of local service delivery, it's not because the revenue is not available or not there, it's because it's not being accessed or because it's not being spent effectively. Uh, and clearly, one of the best things we can do is help local governments to, to spend that money more effectively. Um, and then things like small business development programs, uh, and then social investment. So social investment actually probably should be the last thing you look at. Um, you should be trying to think about all the ways you can leverage what it is you do as a matter of course in your business, uh, and use those value chains. And then when you can't use that, there will be some problems you can't solve through your value chains. And that's where social investment is particularly valuable. You can use for things like welfare to support, for educational support programs, for example. And I guess it starts with understanding the local context, and that's one of the challenges we face. Is the context is very different everywhere where we are. So we have a process called SEEDS. It's freely available online. Um, and what it really is designed to process that's designed to help our local mine management teams go out, understand their host communities in terms of who's there, um, engage with them, identify issues, so housekeeping issues, things we need to do better, but also identify development aspirations, and then put in place structured plans to respond to those aspirations. So, uh, and seats, as I say, it's freely available online and soon to be freely available in, as well as English and Spanish, Portuguese and French as well. So that's the foundation of how we start to try to plan our interventions at site level. And for us, really, there are these macro debates, but the reality of risk in our business, the risk to us actually manifests itself at site level. So it's important we understand that. Uh, on local procurement, we sort of have a two-pronged um, two approach. One is trying to stimulate the supply side, and one is trying to stimulate the demand side to encourage our own procurement teams to buy more locally, and that starts with a policy. So all of our sites have to have a local procurement strategy. Uh, they have to have people not who are responsible. We've got um, certain initiatives to try and pull more demand for local procurement. So ring fencing certain categories, for example, changing contract terms potentially to make contracts more accessible to local businesses, and then targets and KPIs. So that's trying to sort of increase our demand for procurement from local areas. And then we're also trying to uh, on the other side, to try to stimulate the supply. And that starts with very grassroots microcredit programs. We probably wouldn't buy much from these kinds of entrepreneurs, except perhaps food, for example. But they do start to provide a sort of seed bed of people who might then be able to go on and run businesses in the formal economy. So as I said, we have some very large enterprise development programs now. In South Africa, it's about 30,000 jobs. In Chile, it's about 30,000 jobs being created. And we're looking to, uh, in fact, we've all started new programs in Peru, Botswana, Brazil this year to try and uh, spread, spread that good practice. We're also interested in working with existing suppliers or potential suppliers who are in the formal sector who have got to a certain size but aren't growing any further and see if we can unlock their potential to build, um, you know, build their capacity to grow and become bigger suppliers to us but also suppliers to other companies in the mining sector but also outside the sector. And then finally we're also trying to localise some of our suppliers to so bring bring some of those sort of tier one contractors we might have for the likes of Kamasi or Caterpillar to be co-located with us or located very close to us on industrial parks. Because they themselves will tend to have an ecology of businesses that support them as well. So we want those jobs in our areas supporting <laughs> our communities. So. Uh, capacity development. I mentioned we pay a lot of taxes. This is actually the, the breakdown by country. Um, and you know, in places like South Africa and Peru, for example, there's a lot of taxes that are paid by by mining, a very high proportion of the tax take in the country is generated by mining, but very often, particularly at the local level where it hits us most, the capacity to deliver on that is quite weak. So we're interested in looking at municipal capacity development programs. In South Africa, we have a, an MOU with uh, the Development Bank of Southern Africa uh, to assess capacity and then put in place structured interventions in 10 of our host municipalities. We will expand that this year to encompass additional municipalities. Uh, and then we're thinking about how we can spread that. And really what that's designed to do is to ensure that that money actually ensures that those municipalities are delivering on their basic service obligations. So sort of local health care, education, water, electricity, housing, transport, etc. So they can actually use the money that, that is available to them, uh, partly because that's a positive developmental outcome, but also partly because if the local government doesn't do it, people tend to look to us for, for help. Um, because we're perceived as having the money and capacity to do it. Um, small business development programs. I think I've, um, I think I've talked about this enough already. That this, that was the 2011 figure. It's now 2013. 
2012 with over 60,000 jobs to be created. And we do it through a variety of means, but principally through advancing equity to bigger loans, to, to bigger businesses, and then for smaller businesses we advance loans at a concessionary rate. And we're interested in doing this partly because actually we think we think we probably do too much through social investment and grant making that we should be doing through more entrepreneurial means. And enterprise development, our experience is that actually those you know, small businesses that are well set up are much more durable, for example, than social investment projects. Because once they're up and running, they're viable and they're self-sustaining, whereas social investment projects will generally always need some degree of grant funding. So we, we think it's important. Um, we're also interested in working with some of the big NGOs in this space, people like Tech Reserve and Care, uh, who've got a lot of expertise. We run some of our programs in-house, but we're increasingly working with specialist partners. Uh, and then also partnering with development finance institutions, because they're also very interested in stimulating um, supply chains, particularly around the mining sector. So uh, we have an MOU now with the Inter American Development Bank to look at opportunities across South America, uh, whereby we can um, use their capital that they've got allocated for small business development programs, but they don't have delivery on So there's a nice link there. And then finally, social investment, and we split these up between ones that leverage the core business uh, and ones that um, are more sort of separated from our core business, but which nonetheless can be very important um, to those local communities, uh, and which can provide, um, can provide very important developmental outcomes. So just to uh, wrap up, I mean, resource nationalism has um, emerged in recent years as sort of one of the key risks for our sector. If you look at the global risk reports like the likes of Deloitte or uh, Ernst & Young, the last few years resource nationalism has been right up there. It's normally number one and number two in the global risk rankings of, of the global mining sector. But, but it isn't new. Um, and the fact that it isn't new in some ways is reassuring. So it does mean we've been able to learn some of the lessons from the past. Uh, and in some ways, actually, the current manifestations are less threatening and less menace menacing than they were in the past. So having your tax rate put up is actually not something we'd welcome, but um, it is much less threatening than being expropriated, because once you're expropriated, you're sort of out, whereas tax rates do go up and down. And governments, you know, they, governments will understand the economic cycle. They'll know when we're relatively profitable. They'll understand when there's a need to create incentives to invest. And, and that's sort of some of the normal parts of sort of the toing and froing between the industry and has governments and has gone on for a long time. But, if they're fundamentally just changing tax rates, well, actually, tax rates go up, but they also go down. Whereas, once you've been expropriated on the whole, you're out. And even if they try to get you back in, we've had experience where we've had mines that were nationalized, and we've been invited to come back in again. But very often, because the mines weren't run properly under state ownership, they're actually not worth continuing to investment too much to get them up to a productive level again. Some of the drivers of resource nationalism are you know, do arise from misunderstandings around some of the economic contributions that mining makes, and also misunderstandings around um, the profitability of the sector, which, as I said earlier, isn't actually as fantastic over the long run as, as it has been in recent years. Um, we do invest very much for the long term, so you know, to get you know, to, to get to an operating mine, you've probably done a thousand bits of reconnaissance on on exploration, you've probably done a hundred drilling campaigns, and get down to two or three of prospects. And, and then you've got, a mine. out of all of that activity, you might get a mine, you've probably have spent three, four, five billion dollars to build that mine. So you probably are, and you're already at 10 years by then, by the time you're producing first metal, for example, on a copper mine. Um, you probably need to operate that mine for five to 10 years before you've even got your money back, let alone the river before you return capital to shareholders. So, and that's not well understood by most people. Um, we need to communicate more effectively, but I think we also do need to recognize there's much more we can do as a sector try and boost the benefits from, from mining. Um, and the, the, the dialogue and the partnerships around that have come on an awfully long way in the last five years in particular. I think a much bigger focus on how we can use the activity created by mining to create local development. And create development that's actually much more inclusive than perhaps it has been in the past. And I suppose that's one of the, one of the challenges we face now is that many of the places where we're operating as a business, those societies are very divided. So places like Brazil and in Chile and South Africa have very high Gini coefficients. And there are people who, for one reason or another, are excluded from participating in the benefits of the formal economy. So even if you're getting economic growth driven by money, you might not be getting a very porous and society benefit. And for us, that's a major long-term risk. So we need to find ways to bring those currently excluded people into the benefits of mining so that they too can feel that there's a, 
that there's a benefit for them in terms of um, a prosperous and successful mining industry. And if we don't, we're always going to struggle um, to get the license to operate. Okay. I'll leave it there.